Police, stop! Stop! This community is being run by 30 to 40 youths that run rampage on our street every single night. In the past week alone, multiple businesses have been targeted by young offenders. And residents say it's no longer a crime crisis, it's an emergency. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. Chaos and mayhem on the streets of Alice Springs has now become a nightly show, with sometimes 200 kids involved, brawling, breaking into shops and offices, or like these 11 to 13-year-olds, driving stolen cars head-on at NT Police while baiting them into pursuit. And why are they doing it? The ABC's Jane Barden asked. Because at home you've got nothing to do and there's no really family to look after. So, was that all from last week? Well, no. It was November and December. You see, there's been madness on the streets of Alice for months now, but only local media and the ABC have really been covering it. Until Peter Dutton and Anthony Albanese made a national story. Then, last week, the interest of the tabloids and TV networks was turbocharged by this video footage from a local nurse. They are the chaotic scenes that left nurse Rachel shaken to the core. I have never felt so terrified in my life. I fear for my life that night. The mayhem filmed from her motel room balcony in Alice Springs. Nine News was just one of the outlets that jumped on Rachel's story. Today's Carl Stefanovic also made her a headline act as she blamed the trouble in the town on terrible tales of Indigenous sexual abuse. I myself, I'm a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for almost 14 years. And the level of trauma and shocking occurrences of sexual violence I have seen, it, it haunts me. I have seen a four-year-old boy come in with anal warts. I've seen a six-year-old girl with vaginal sores. According to Rachel, this abuse of Indigenous children was the reason all those kids, some as young as five and six, were running loose on the streets of Alice Springs at night. Why, why aren't the families and the parents being held responsible? And I guess the short answer to that is that these kids are being raped at home. That is quite a claim. But she made it again to 2GB's Ben Fordham in a long interview on his breakfast show. It's an uncomfortable conversation, but these kids are being raped at home and the domestic violence is horrific. Us healthcare workers have got some form of PTSD because we see a lifelong career of this. That night, Rachel also got star billing on Sky with Peter Credlin, who had actually been the first to get her footage. And she told the same shocking stories. I've seen things that will haunt me forever. I've seen a little four-year-old boy come in with the anal warts, a six-year-old girl with the, the vaginal sores. I, I'm holding myself together because I find this harrowing. Um, what, happens when you, what happens when you report that up the chain? Having left presenters in shock, Rachel was also making waves online in the Daily Mail and news.com.au, which ran video of the brawl outside her hotel and repeated her confronting claims. So who exactly was she? The Daily Mail told readers that Rachel had 14 years of nursing in communities near Alice Springs and Darwin, while Sky described her as an Alice Springs local who has been a nurse in Alice Springs and the surrounding communities for several years. But Nine News wasn't so sure, reporting that she'd moved to the NT only seven years ago and was a visitor to town. What none revealed was that since 2017, she's actually been working in cosmetic clinics. Indeed, her business listing tells us... Rachel Hale is a cosmetic nurse in Darwin. After owning a laser clinic in Darwin, she decided to open her own laser clinic here in Alice Springs. So, if her stories are first-hand, they may not be that new. And some were clearly hearsay. They saw a man raping an eight-year-old girl and he had covered her entire lower part of her body with butter and the girl was not crying, she wasn't moving, she wasn't screaming. It was just normal behaviour for her. Rachel's stories are also not from Alice Springs because, as she admitted on Friday, in response to a wave of online trolling and abuse, she hasn't worked in frontline health in the town. I never said I worked in Alice. The abuse is the same everywhere. Now, there's no doubt that Rachel has worked in Aboriginal health and we're not suggesting she's making it up. Nor are we saying that sexual abuse of Indigenous children is not a massive problem in the NT. But... When the media gives someone a huge megaphone like that, they really ought to do some checks and dial down the hype. Not least because blanket claims like this... These kids are being raped at home. ..are inflammatory, smear all Indigenous people and can easily fan racism. Rachel told us that was not her intention. Her concern is for the kids and how better to protect them. 
Nurse Rachel's story was ignored by the ABC, but in reporting the troubles in Alice and generally doing it well, the public broadcaster was generating a big fuss of its own, branding a group of local residents white supremacists. ABC Ignites Alice Race War, Mayor. Auntie slammed for kicking teeth to locals. Yep, Mayor Matt Patterson did not hold back in the Daily Telegraph about AM's coverage of a town meeting on Monday night, and he took to the airwaves repeatedly to make his point clear. This is the, you know, a kick in the teeth to people who want to see change, and it's certainly not uh, the way that this community yeah. is. And again, I call on the chair of the ABC to retract the comment and put out a public apology to the community of Alice Springs. So, what did the mayor want retracted? It was a report from Sydney-based Indigenous Affairs reporter Carly Williams, who was in Alice for a week, and covered a lively meeting of 3,000 locals considering suing the NT government. Hundreds of people gathered last night to discuss the problems plaguing Alice Springs, but many locals soon left, some frustrated, others in tears. How many locals was not clear, but the strident views of two of them set the tone for Williams' report. It was really a disgusting show of white supremacy and really, really disappointing. It was scary to be in that room and that doesn't represent in Bantua and Aranda country the way I know it. The tension and violence and the anger in the room was really palpable and it was clearly all around white supremacy and the safety of white people in this town and that, that's all that's been considered. And race was on the mind of the next voice that Williams put to air. I am way more concerned about the danger posed by those people in there, those white people that have a choice where to live here, than vulnerable Aboriginal children whose connection to this country cannot be broken. So, were those views representative of the 3,000 townspeople there? And did white supremacy really rear its ugly head? Not according to meeting organiser Garth Thompson, who told Radio National later that day that the racists in the room were the ones driven out. The whole background to our meeting last night was non-political, non-aggressive, non-confrontational, non-anything. Apart from a small group that came in there with that in their mind already, they were disgusted by them. And that's who you people have tried to promote this morning. You people being the ABC. And local country Liberal MP Josh Burgoyne agreed. To hear AM actually basically, as you rightly said, only interview what must have been about a dozen people out of the 3,000 um, it certainly didn't show a balanced um, report as to what actually occurred that evening. Balance was indeed very much missing in the ABC's report, which aired across AM and news radio. There was no attempt to explain what the meeting was about or canvass the views of the majority. And having watched it in full and talked to journalists who went along, we think the story should never have been put to air. As Indigenous leader and former Labour Party president turned Liberal politician Warren Mundine told Sky... And I thought these people are off with the fairies. I, I thought they, they went to a different universe, a different dimension uh, from what was happening at that meeting. And they made out as a sort of like some Ku Klux Klan meeting going on inside, which was, could be no further than from the truth. Mundine was not alone in being shocked by the reporting. Local ABC journalists were angry too. They say the story has caused a backlash against the ABC and the NT and eroded years of trust and goodwill. Although it is worth noting that Alice Mayor Matt Patterson gives them a clean bill of health and says they have covered the difficult issues fairly. So, what is the ABC's response? On Wednesday, it claimed the report was fine and issued a statement to say, essentially, move along, nothing to see. But late Friday, after Media Watch had contacted them and Liberal Senator Sarah Henderson flagged a complaint to the Media Watchdog, the ABC did say sorry. Or as the Australian chortled, ABC issues extraordinary apology. The key passage reads... ABC News apologises to audiences for providing an incomplete picture of the event in this instance. Following this report, ABC News published additional coverage of the issue, which included a broader range of perspectives and context. It's not the strongest apology, and the story is still up unchanged. And why the ABC couldn't say it on Wednesday is beyond me. But at least they have now admitted the mistake. Let's hope they can learn from it. But now to a remarkable story about political spin and media management, exposed for all the world to see. The secrets of spin doctors for the former coalition government have been exposed at the Royal Commission into the bungled robo-debt scheme. In testimony today, a former senior media advisor gave evidence that right-wing media outlets were fed information to discredit claims coming from victims. 
Well, well, well. That may be no great surprise to political and media insiders, but it's almost unheard of for a former spin doctor to reveal the dirty detail of how governments warp the news. Rochelle Miller, of course, has played whistleblower before on a more personal matter. On Four Corners in 2020, she dished the dirt on sexism and bullying in Parliament and revealed a consensual affair with Human Services Minister Alan Tudge, who was in charge of the RoboDebt scheme. Last week, she revealed to the Royal Commission her role in pushing the policy. It was Rochelle Miller's job to help promote the RoboDebt scheme. I took one look at it and went, there's a good story here. In the government's view, there certainly was. Punishing welfare cheats and clawing back what they don't deserve with an automated system that cost little to taxpayers. But who could tell the story? Miller picked out Sarah Martin from The Australian. So she got what we call a drop or an exclusive from us to run the story. That was a common practice. Rather than just sending out a media release and hoping that a journalist might just pick it up, um, you, you then you then take away the exclusive. Um, if it's an exclusive, it's more likely to end up on the front page. And did it work? You bet. Splashed as an exclusive across page one. $4.5 million in overpayments found every day as 20,000 people a week caught in crackdown. Now the story was out there, other media came knocking. That night, Nine's a current affair, which has always loved a dull bludger, gave the minister a pulpit. The government says they've got a new high-tech system that's helping catch out the cheats who've been stealing from the taxpayer. We will find you, we will track you down, and you will have to repay those debts and you may end up in prison. So far, so good. But there was a hitch. The Guardian and others began to uncover worrying problems with the system. Centrelink officer says only a fraction of debts in welfare crackdown are genuine. So was the minister worried? Well, not at first. We weren't too concerned because it wasn't unusual that the left-wing media were attacking us regarding social policy. At which point the commissioner asked who exactly was in that left-wing club. Where does the ABC fit in all this? Uh, I would have said that they were in the left-wing media camp. Where was the Sydney Morning Herald in your spectrum? Left-wing media. The Guardian and the Saturday paper were also on the left-wing list who could be ignored. Except the criticism did not go away. In late December, the ABC reported... There are growing calls for Centrelink to halt its new automated compliance system after a number of citizens reported being issued incorrect debt notices. And in January, powerfully negative stories were ramping up in the Nine papers too, documenting Centrelink's litany of inhuman errors and warning of victims on the edge of suicide. Now concern was rising. The minister returned from holidays to deal with the crisis. As Miller recalled... He was very firm with me that I needed to shut this story down. And how did they do that? Cue more dark arts. That involved, you know, placing stories with the, um, you know, the more friendly media, the right-wing media, about how the coalition was actually catching people who were cheating the welfare system. More friendly journalists were needed for this, and Miller knew who to call and how to direct them. You worked with them and provided them with the information which would enable the story... Um, yes. Yes. ..to be written in a way that the minister liked. Yes. Or at least presented in a way that the minister liked. Yes. And Simon Benson was very good at doing that. Simon Benson is the very good political reporter for The Australian, who delivered another ripping front-page splash for the government. Centrelink victims owe thousands. Debt scare backfires on Labor. Exclusive. And Benson helpfully included the talking points and case studies supplied by the Minister's office. Another bullseye. And Miller had friends in other newsrooms too. All of the tabloids, the Australian, uh, and some of the, the commercial television channels. Plus Sky News and 2GB, Miller said. And what was the nastiest trick of all? Leaking the personal details of supposed welfare rorters to the media, which had just the effect the minister wanted. Did you notice any impact of the decision to release personal information in the, into the media um, upon the nature of media stories from that point? Yes. And what was the impact you observed? Well, there were less people speaking out in the media, which was the intention. It was a brilliant political strategy, until it wasn't. 
because eventually the harm reaped by the robo-debt policy could no longer be denied. A federal court judge called robo-debt a shameful chapter and a massive failure of public administration. It was shameful for the coalition government, its ministers and their minders, but also, in my view, for many in the media, who were used by the government to run propaganda and discredit victims. And now they've been exposed. Q apologies and embarrassment? Seems not. The Australian's editor-in-chief, Michelle Gunn, told me to watch that Simon Benson was a renowned newsbreaker, and the paper rejected Rochelle Miller's characterisation of his journalism. That's all from us for tonight. Don't forget Media Bytes, Thursdays on Facebook, YouTube and iView. But for now till next week, goodbye.